some studies, anywhere between 40 and 75% of the food available at supermarkets here in the United States contains genetically modified or genetically engineered ingredients. When it comes to processed food, that number is even higher. As much as 85% of all processed foods for sale in the United States is likely genetically modified, at least to some degree. Supporters of GMO foods say this is nothing to worry about. They say GMOs are perfectly safe and actually do more good than bad. Is that really true? Not so, says my guest for tonight's Conversations with Great Minds, Alliance for Biointegrity founder Stephen Drucker. Drucker is a veteran public interest attorney whose work has exposed the truth about genetically engineered food and the government's cover-up of the evidence. His new book, Altered Genes, Twisted Truth, How, to, how the Venture to Genetically Engineer Our Food Has Subverted Science, Corrupted Government, and Systematically Deceived the Public, is a must-read for one of the biggest scientific frauds of the century. Stephen Drucker, great to have you with us. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. You're, you're an attorney by training. What got you interested in genetically modified foods? Well, I've always been interested in, uh, in food safety issues, and I was shocked when I learned back in about late 1995 of this huge venture that was underway to reconfigure the genetic, genetic core of the world's food supply because I wasn't aware of it until then. I thought, if I'm not aware of it, and I've been very concerned with food safety issues, most people must be totally oblivious of it. And of course, that was the case. I wanted to begin to learn the facts about it. The more I learned, the more I became concerned. And I especially was concerned that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, was promoting GMOs and yet also claiming they could regulate them. But the regulation wasn't there. And I, uh, I started doing more research and eventually it, it became clear the FDA was breaking the law and lying. And uh, I just didn't know how badly they were lying until I brought a lawsuit against them, forced them to divulge over 44,000 pages of their internal documents. That demonstrated that they definitely were lying. Mm. And they knew they were lying. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, it was deliberate. Lying means you know you're lying, otherwise you're just mistaken. No, because what the FDA's been claiming is, we're not aware of any information showing these foods are different in any meaningful way from conventional foods. Well, their files had a lot of information, and it came from their own scientists, who conducted an extensive review of genetically engineered foods, and wrote memo after memo explaining why genetic engineering is different than traditional breeding, why it entails different risks, and why the foods it produces cannot be presumed safe until they're carefully tested. Now that's what the law requires anyway. So this FDA scientists were merely telling their superiors what the law requires is also required as a matter of sound science. What did the FDA do? Well, its administrators decided to follow their promotional agenda and ignore their duty to uphold the law and protect the food supply and protect the health of the American public. So they lied. They said we're not aware of any information. They buried, basically covered up those memos. They claim there's a, an overwhelming consensus in the scientific community that these foods are safe and don't need to be tested. When they knew that the consensus of their own scientists was just the opposite. By the way, there's also a letter in the FDA files from the biotechnology coordinator admitting, a letter to a Canadian health official, admitting that there wasn't a consensus about safety in the scientific community at large either. So they knew that it was a lie to claim these foods were generally recognized as safe, but they went ahead and claimed it. And then they allowed them to come to the market without the requirement of a smidgen of safety testing. There's no safety testing required from the FDA. And there's a voluntary consultation process, which is basically smoke and mirrors to give the illusion that there's some regulation going on. But the FDA has actually admitted, when push came to shove, that they don't regulate genetically engineered foods at all. And they don't. That's about the only time they told the truth, when they admitted that. To what extent do you think that that is the result of the revolving door? I know back during either the tail end of the Reagan administration or early in the Poppy Bush administration, the, there was a push by Monsanto to have the federal government regulate GMOs because that would essentially legalize them. And uh, I believe, my recollection is, uh, that there was a 
a Monsanto senior executive who ended up working for the FDA on this project and then went back to work for Monsanto. And well, you're, you're close on that, Tom. First, it's, I think it's part of the PR scheme to say that Monsanto was asking to be regulated. They didn't want regulation. They don't have regulation. They have what they want. The illusion of regulation, where what they have is self-regulation from the side of the FDA. It's the illusion of regulation, and even the fact that that story has been able to float in the mainstream media, that Monsanto wanted to be regulated, that's just a bunch of hooey. Mm -hmm. And Monsanto, look at the policy. I just mentioned the FDA has admitted that it does not regulate ge genetically engineered foods at all, and they don't. The industry is under no requirements, according to the FDA. Now, according to law, they are. According to law, according to U.S. food safety law, these foods are presumed unsafe and have to be proven safe, but the FDA has circumvented the law and exempted these foods from the law and said to Monsanto and DuPont and Dow Chemical, you don't have to, you don't have to test these foods at all. Don't even send us the, initial, the original data. If you do do tests, we're not interested. Just send us whatever you care to send us and we'll rubber stamp it. I mean, that's essentially what they've said and what they've been doing. Now, the revolving door, you're darn right on that one, but uh, you're not quite right on when this particular individual became a Monsanto executive. You're speaking about Michael Taylor, who began his career as an FDA scientist, held several important legal positions at the FDA, then went through a revolving door in one sense, went to work as a partner at a major Washington, D.C. law firm that represented Monsanto and the International Food Biotechnology Council. He was essentially Monsanto's main outside counsel. Uh, in, the, in the summer of 1991, the FDA basically brought him back as deputy commissioner for policy. And that was essentially to shepherd uh, through the policy on genetically engineered foods. So was that lax policy that came into place while Michael Taylor, uh, who had been Monsanto's attorney, was in that sense of position. After he gave Monsanto, or the FDA, while he was there, gave Monsanto everything it wanted, uh, one assumes that he had quite a heavy hand in it, he got hired directly by Monsanto as vice president for public policy at their Washington office. Essentially, Washington became Washington's chief lobbyist for Monsanto. Amazingly, he's back at the FDA now. President Obama appointed him back, uh, I can't remember, I think a year and a half, two years ago. He's basically, they call him the food czar. He's in charge of all food safety at the, at the uh, FDA. So talk about a revolving door. That is the, <laughs> one of the grossest examples. And somehow there's been no big complaint, official complaint. How are they getting away with it? That's amazing. It's like a trampoline. It's, um, let's go back to first, uh, back to the beginning before we drill a little deeper into GMOs here. In Gregor Mendel back in the day, you know, came up with this uh, Mendel Square, you know, the idea of, of uh, how do you breed uh, sweet peas, I think it was. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, most people think that hybridization, breeding, things like that, that, that GMOs, genetically modified organisms, are just a high-tech variation on that. Yeah. You suggest in the book that that's not the case. I don't just suggest. I just declare it is not the case, and I demonstrate that it is not. In fact, you call it hacking genes rather than... Yeah, just... it's much closer to biohacking when we look at it from the standpoint of software engineering and computer science. But when we stay within the realm of bio biological science, it also is a radical break with traditional breeding. A uh, Nobel laureate biologist uh, George Wald, who was a professor at Harvard, stated that genetic engineering represents the biggest break in nature that has occurred in human history. And he said it should not be uh, mixed up or mistaken for any previous human intervention in the natural order. So this is not at all the way the currently uh, genetically engineered crops have been created bears really very little resemblance to traditional breeding through sexually available pathways. And it's a radical change, and it entails different risks. And uh, again, the FDA scientists said that, many eminent scientists have said that, who understand the facts and who are, who are not afraid to tell the truth. And an eminent molecular biologist who was a plaintiff in the lawsuit I organized against the FDA declared at the press conference we held in Washington, D.C., announcing the press conference that those 
uh, scientists who claim that genetic engineering is essentially the same as traditional breeding, he said they're perpetrating a sham and, and they should be ashamed of themselves. And then he said to the reporters, and you can quote me on that. Unfortunately, none of them did. Who got quoted? The shills for the industry. So Why is there's that? a media shutdown. Well, I'm not sure exactly the reason, but we know it's happened. There's an entire chapter in my book titled Malfunction of the Mainstream American Media, Pliant Accomplices in Cover-Up and Fraud. And they are. The mainstream media has abetted the FDA's fraud and the disinformation campaign of the industry. They have covered up the evidence of the FDA fraud. I have, uh, uh, at another press conference, given the media, basically, the information from the FDA's own files showing what their scientists actually said, showing how their concerns were covered up. That does not get published. Is it that... just doesn't get published in the mainstream media. It got published in European media. Is that, is that because uh, uh, genetically modified, the companies that do this are big advertisers? Is it because they have interlocking boards with these giant media corporations that now control most of our media? I think both of those. And in fact, but it is interesting that the founding director of the uh, FDA's Office of Biotechnology, Dr. Henry I. Miller, who was with the FDA many years, stated in a newspaper interview that when it came to biotechnology, the federal executive agencies have done everything that the biotechnology, uh, biotechnology industry asked them to do and told them to do. He even admitted, we did what they told us to do. They were calling the shots. They weren't just making requests. They were giving orders. Oh, wow. So, uh, to the FDA. In, well, apparently, in, according to what Dr. Miller has said, asked them to do and told them to do. In addition to embedding their people in the FDA. Yeah, well, yeah. that was, perhaps they were told to do that, too. I mean, I'm assuming Michael Taylor is not the only guy. No, not at all. There's been a tremendous revolving door uh, on, well, on many issues, we know, but it becomes the most glaring and unsavory, I think, of all of them when we look at the GMO issue. Just, you can look at FDA and USDA and U.S. Trade representative back and forth from government to Monsanto, either the board of directors or an executive, some other position with the industry, another player in the industry. It stinks. It really does. Yeah. And somehow they keep getting away with it. It's amazing. More of tonight's Conversations with Great Minds. We're going to drill down into what this really means with Stephen Drucker right after the break. Conversations with Great Minds. I'm speaking with Alliance for Biointegrity founder Stephen Drucker, author of the new book, Altered Genes, Twisted Truth, How a Venture to gen Genetically Engineer Our Food Has Subverted Science, Corrupted Government, and Systematically Deceived the Public. Um, Stephen, subverting science, well, actually, before we get to subverting science, we, you know, we, we spent the last segment talking about how this, is, this stuff is not safe. Uh -huh. What does that mean? What specifically is not safe about genetically modified foods? Well, they entail risks that are not found in conventional food. Now, this is generic risks. There may be one or another genetically engineered food that is, in fact, safe to eat. But the legal pres the presumption of our law is that they should all be presumed unsafe until demonstrated safe. And from the perspectives of both biological science and computer science, that presumption is quite sound in their case because we know that genetic engineering can create a whole range of unintended disruptions to the to the genome of the organism that gets uh, reconfigured and that there can be uh, uh, unexpected toxins created that would are normally not found in that species and yet exist and are difficult to detect through analytical means could only be detected through extensive long-term safety testing uh, if at all could be detected through that, testing the likes of which have not been really done for any genetically engineered food. There could be new allergens created. We know that. We've seen examples of, of a protein that was ordinarily safe, but when in the context of a foreign organism, it gets changed within the, within the organism and becomes allergenic. So that doesn't happen in traditional breeding. So there could be several different kinds of unintended toxins. There could be new allergens. There could be other substances uh, that might not be downright toxic, but are, are called anti-nutritive. 
And so again, they create problems for digestion. So it's very important that none of these foods, none of these foods should have come to market without having been proven safe, demonstrated safe, through standard scientific testing. The legal standard is they have to be shown that there's a reasonable certainty of no harm. And that's a pretty high standard. These, these products, these foods, uh, came into the marketplace in a big way in the 90s and early 2000s. Right. So they've only been around for basically a generation and a half, two generations at the most, uh, human generations. Um, and during that time, we've seen uh, Synthroid, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, five, five, six years ago, Synthroid, which is a thyroid hormone for, for uh, people who have lost thyroid function, become the most widely prescribed drug in America. Um, now, the most widely prescribed drug is, a, is an immune suppressor. I think it's uh, Humira, maybe? I'm, I'm forgetting the brand names of these drugs, but basically it, it, it suppresses uh, the, the hyperactivity of our immune system. Mm. And so the question, you know, which, which manifests in a whole variety of ways, from psoriasis to, to multiple sclerosis or whatever. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are asking the question, well, what's triggering an immune response? You just mentioned allergens. I mean, immune response is how the body responds to allergens. Um, we've seen an explosion in autism. We've seen an explosion in, in uh, obesity. I mean, these, you, you look at the curves on these conditions, and literally just over the last 30 years, correct me if I'm wrong, they seem to be exploding when the, you know, the, the, the 100 years before that, uh, people didn't even know about many of these conditions. Is it, is it possible, is there evidence that genetically modified foods are associated with any of these things that I just described? Well, it, there's correlation. Uh, there, as far as I know, there hasn't been hard proof yet, but that would be hard to do, difficult to do right now. There haven't been epidemiological studies. There should have been, but there haven't been. In fact, it's almost impossible to do them without labeling. That's one of the reasons. Arguably, isn't, isn't a, an epidemiological study going on right now in the United States? We're all the guinea pigs? Well, it's, not, a, us to, it's uh, not an experiment. That's the problem. People are dying right now, or people getting these diseases. If, it, if one or another is, a, is caused by one or another genetically engineered food, which has not been ruled out, uh, we don't know it. So actually, it's not an experiment. An experiment means if something bad happens, you know it and you know what caused it because you've controlled the experiment. This is an uncontrolled uh, gamble, so it's not even appropriate to call it any kind of an experiment because people could be dying from these foods now and for years to come and we wouldn't know it. We wouldn't know what the cause is, so it's not an experiment. There should have been experiments on laboratory animals before any of these foods came out. So it's a reckless gamble with the health of Americans. Uh, the, but again, we don't know for sure. Now the important thing is none of these foods have been proven to be safe, and they should have been. And as you and I were discussing during the break, the very first ingestible product of genetic engineering did cause harm. We know that. It caused a major epidemic back in 1989 and 1990, killed dozens of Americans, seriously sickened, according to CDC estimates, between four and 5,000 people. Hundreds of those people are still invalids, and that came from ingesting a product created through genetic engineering. And as my book demonstrates, the weight of the evidence points toward genetic engineering as the source of that unusual toxic contamination that caused the epidemic. And that product was L-tryptophan. Yes, it was a supplement of the food, uh, it was a supplement of L-tryptophan, a safe essential amino acid right. that the, became highly contaminated with an unusual toxin or toxins. Right, the normally you'd find in food. Um, back, to, back to the, this is not an experiment. Arguably, isn't there a control group in, for example, Thailand or uh, you know, some other country that has a large agricultural base that is not using genetically modified foods and that isn't seeing the explosion of obesity, the explosion of uh, asthma, the explosion of uh, you know, whatever that, that we're seeing here? Are, could, could it, is it possible that you could do an epidemiological logical analysis of the United States versus countries where GMO foods don't exist? Possible. Now, I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, so, you know, I think you could get some interesting, uh, fill in the gaps a little more in our knowledge, but I have a feeling in terms of just, 
uh, a study that really could be published and say we have established a link as solidly as the link has been established between smoking cigarettes and lung cancer, I, don't, I think you'd have to do a much better study than that because you can't control for all the variables between populations in other countries and here. There are many other, uh, other changes that could be accounting for things. So you've got to really try to control for every variable and only have the difference, the one you want to test. You, uh, in the title of your book, uh, the subtitle, How the Venture to Genetically Engineer Our Food Has Subverted Science, Corrupted Government. We've talked about government corruption and systematically deceived the public. We've talked about that. Talk about the subversion of science itself. That is actually the main theme of the book, because the book demonstrates if the mainstream scientific establishment had actually told the truth from the beginning about what genetic engineering is, and also about how genetic engineering of crops is deeply different than traditional breeding and had not also actually <laughs> fudged uh, basic facts of biology, if they hadn't attacked scientists who have conducted uh, very solid research that has demonstrated uh, problems with one or another genetically engineered food, genetically engineered foods couldn't have come to the market anyway. The FDA could not have perpetrated its fraud if the groundwork had not been laid for many years by the mainstream scientific establishment. And again, this is not some empty claim. My book documents this very thoroughly, and it's been praised by scientists who have reviewed it. So there really has been systematic deception by eminent scientists and scientific institutions from the beginning of genetically engineered food, uh, genetic engineering, years before it could even create a, a, a successful food. From the beginning, and it goes on today, so that without that fraud being perpetrated by the scientific establishment, these foods couldn't be on the market. The, is, the whole edifice would have top. It couldn't have been built in the first place. Yeah, this might, this might be another correla uh, causation or correlation without causation question. But um, prior to the prior to Reaganism, you know, the, the Reagan Revolution, most scientific research in the United States was funded directly or indirectly via the federal government and, and through universities and even independent agencies. Nowadays, so much of this has been privatized. The science, science is now an industry rather than, a, rather than science. Is, is that what's causing this? Well, it's certainly, I think, one of, the, one of the causes, as several scientists have lamented, there are so few uh, scientists left that are just interested in science for its own sake, especially in the life sciences. Everything the universities are interested in getting patents and monetizing things. And, and again, you were, it's a very good point. To a large, to a significant extent, research is now funded by industry. And they put strings on that. And it's not a good situation at all. There are very few scientists, there are, I don't know about very few, but there are too few scientists that are operating fully independent of the pressures of industry, of industry money. I mean, you look at so many universities, the Monsanto Hall for this, and the DuPont Pavillon, Pavilion, and there are so, so much money being donated to universities that are research universities by the industries. I mean, just like they contribute to campaign contributions of of uh, senators and representatives, they're also contributing to universities and science departments. Pre and they, you know, money gives you a lot of power and control. Yeah, and pre-1980, that was considered corruption. Of yeah, science. well, I mean, it still is corruption in my book. <laughs> I'm with you. Uh, in the minute and a half or so we have left, you, you talked, you mentioned that this is like hacking. Uh, there's a chapter in your book about how, uh, drawing parallels between software and genetically modified foods. Yeah. I, I, we have very little time. Right. Can you want to summarize? Yeah. It's called Overlooked Lessons from Computer Science and the inescapable risks of altering complex information systems. We know, we mean in the human race, know through uh, decades now of computer science that even when information systems between, become big enough and complex enough, you cannot revise them and presume that you will not create any unintended consequences. We know that. Even systems that the human mind has created, and if the software engineer that wrote that system tries to make a precise change that should be clearly predictable and surgical, we know you can't presume that it's precise. They become too interactive 
and there, there's a risk of unintended consequences, and that's why in life-critical systems, software systems that guide an airplane or guide a pacemaker, uh, the, there has to be rigorous testing and retesting after any even precise revision. What happens in the, in the field of genetic engineering? The, the biggest, most complex, interactive information systems on the planet about which we know very little are being radically revised, and they say they're safe. Stephen Drucker, brilliant work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. To see this and other Conversations of the Great Minds, go to our website at conversationsofgreatminds.com. And that's the way it is tonight, Thursday, July 30th, 2015. Don't forget, democracy begins with you. Get out there, get active, tag, you're it.